the Advanced Healing Series by Charles and Francis Hunter. This exciting Advanced Healing Tape Series is designed to bring you, the believer, into a further understanding of the new techniques of healing the Holy Spirit has brought to Charles and Francis Hunter since their first introduction of the How to Heal the Sick videotape series. During the next 12 hours of audio video instruction, you will discover many new ways to heal the sick. Pay special attention to Charles's explanation of the light switch principle. And then as Francis and Charles demonstrate on how to get more success in the healing of pain, you will also be introduced to their new book, Handbook for Healing, a book that makes healing as simple as one, two, three. We hope you'll enjoy this totally new series as much as the tens of thousands of believers all across the United States and around the world have enjoyed the original healing series by Charles and Francis Hunter. And now, the Advanced Healing Series, Hour One. Convention headquarters of the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship International. Uh, we're here in an advanced teaching to uh, develop and equip the saints for a great work of God's ministry around the world. Dima Shakarian, who got this marvelous vision that started the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, and not only went around the earth twice, he went around the earth in the spirit once, uh, where God showed him the despondency, the downheartedness, the, the people uh, bowed down in depressions, and then God took him back in the spirit a second time, and this time he saw men everywhere with their hands lifted up and the happy people all over the world. But something he hasn't often shared, that at least we haven't heard, was that he saw a work of the disciples, just like in the days of the disciples, he saw that men everywhere were out in their daily walk of life doing mighty miracles and mighty exploits for God, using the power of God, using the dimension Jesus said would happen, and they were going about daily, healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on water, and other things that they did. And uh, Demas said, I saw that in action in the modern time with all the people in the full gospel, their families, and people they minister to, suddenly bursting forth with all over the world doing these mighty works of Jesus as late uh, season, as 20th century disciples of Jesus. And then sometime, I suppose it was uh, a year or so ago, Demas said, God, I've seen great works in the full gospel businessmen. I've seen mighty works around the world. I've seen 3,600 chapters develop. We've seen mighty works of God. But he said, God, this has not happened like I saw it in a vision. God, when are you going to make this happen? And God spoke so softly and gently to Demas, but so sternly. He said, Demas, when are you going to make this happen? And when Demas found out about this particular thing Jesus is doing through the earth today to equip the saints, to teach them how to do the supernatural, and the supernatural can be taught, teach them how to daily go about healing the sick where they are so you don't have to pray and hope they get healed. You can move in and heal the sick as a glory of Jesus so that people will believe. He said when he saw that, his heart just exploded, and he told us then and de on December the 2nd, he said, I want this taught to every full gospel businessman, their family, and the people who come in and the repeated ones when they bring new people in, teach them and get them out doing what Jesus showed him in a vision in 1951. And that's why we're uh, here to advance this session. There's much more that we're doing in projecting a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Francis, I think that you should come and share the vision initially that God gave us and let us expand that on into what he's doing uh, in this day. Now, you may listen to these uh, tapes a year from now or uh, maybe two years from now we hope that we're in heaven by then and if we're there we hope you don't see them <laughs> hallelujah but it's real real exciting to know that we're in the last day movement that we are the disciples of this end time ministry before the return of Jesus and God began to deal with us several years ago uh, showing us that if we're going to do what Jesus said to do we better get with it we better get on the way and get it going or it'll be too late and we will have missed God hallelujah Francis Amen. hallelujah I want to give you a, just a, a, a little preview of what started in our lives what is going on today 
uh, Charles and I, from the moment that we both got saved, and we were saved totally uh, hundreds of miles away from each other. As a matter of fact, we didn't even know each other before we got saved because if he had known me, he wouldn't have looked at me and I wouldn't have looked at him. I wouldn't have looked at him because he would, he would have been one of those sweet religious people that made, would probably have just made me sick. And uh, I was such a wild sinner that he wouldn't have looked at me because uh, before I got saved, you were too holy, okay. Before I, got, before I got saved, I didn't get saved until I was 49 years of age. And when I got saved, I was smoking five packages of cigarettes a day, drinking martinis like they were going out of style, uh, the life of every cocktail party because I knew more dirty jokes than anybody else. Couldn't open my mouth and say four words unless one was a swear word. And I never tell that because I'm proud of it. I am proud of what Jesus Christ can do in a life because he certainly turned mine around. The day I got saved, I looked at sin and it made me sick. I couldn't stand it. And so I turned and I ran as fast as I could in the other direction. But once I got saved, something happened to me. I wanted to give away what God had given to me. I wanted everybody saved. I looked at the world and I thought, oh, they're all lost, they're dying, they're going to hell, and nobody's out there doing anything about it at all. And so uh, I took off the, the day I got saved. I got up from the altar, went down U.S. Highway number one. I was saved in Miami, Florida. Went down U.S. Highway number one, tried to beat Jesus Christ into the head of every person that I met. I wanted them to know Jesus because I knew that something had happened to me. And, uh, and so I wanted to give away what God had given to me. And then Charles and I met and married, never had a date with each other, never saw each other from the time we met. He was a spiritual dried up prune for some, <laughs> I'm not talking about him, I'm quoting his book, but he was a spiritual dried up prune for approximately 31 years. And then one day he went into an altar of a church and he said the same words in Houston, Texas that I had said three years before that in Miami, Florida. I said, God, if you want what's left of this mess, take her, but take all of her. And then I said, God, I'll make a deal with you. I'll give you all of me, all my cigarettes, all my dirty jokes, all that junk. I said, I'll give you all of me for all of you. And uh, I got the best end of the deal. That's for real, <laughs> that's for real, sure. And uh, then it was after that, you see, and then Charles said, God, take all my life and make me spiritually what you want me to be. And it's in that total giving of your life to God with no reservations, nothing holding back. That's the thing that can totally change your life. And Charles instantly looked like he'd swallowed a light bulb. Everybody noticed the difference, and yet it took place so fast. It was just one of those little things in the twinkling of an eye. And then God looked down in Florida, and then he looked down in Texas, and he said, I gotta get those two fanatics together. <laughs> and so I went to Houston to speak at a Bible college, and that wasn't really the purpose of it. My main purpose was to meet the world's most handsome, charming, adorable, kind, loving, beautiful <laughs> man in all the world. Now, Charles and I never had a date. This will show you that nothing is impossible with God. Charles and I never had a date, never saw each other until he came to, from the time we met, till he came to Miami to claim me as his bride. He missed me in the airport. It was the 22nd of December. I had a big red bow in my head, on my, in my hair, and it said, to Charles from God. And in spite of that, <laughs> in spite of that, he passed me by, I passed him by, because we didn't know what the other one looked like. But I'm delighted to tell you that we celebrated our 17th perfect wedding anniversary recently. And I say perfect because Jesus is the center of our lives, our home, and our marriage. And I don't know how anybody ever makes it without that, because it, it, that's the thing that, that molds you together. That's the thing that keeps strife and arguing out of a home. Because like Charles always says, if I were to say something nasty to Frances, I would be talking to the Jesus that lives on the inside of her. How many of you know that'll make a difference in your conversation? You see, and when I talk to Charles, it's the same as though I'm talking to the Jesus on the inside of him. So would I say something nasty to Jesus? 
No. <coughs> you see, it makes a lot of difference when you realize that Jesus Christ lives on the inside of the person that you're married to. Hopefully, I hope you all have, uh, you all have Christian spouses. And so Charles and I, when we got together, wanted to give away everything that God gave us. For I think two years, we went around sharing our love story around the nation, how God had supernaturally brought us together. God's the one that told us to get married, and he never tells a man unless he tells a woman, and he never tells the woman unless he tells the man. And so we, we, we wanted everybody uh, to have that same Christian mate that God had provided for the two of us. So we wanted to give it away, and we wanted to give away all the secrets that God had given to us about what makes a perfect marriage, because marriage can be perfect. You don't have to argue, and you don't have to bicker, and you don't have to fight, because in 17 years, we've never had a crossword with each other, nor have we ever had an argument of any kind. Now, that is not because of Francis Hunter. I can guarantee you that. That's not because of Charles Hunter. I can guarantee you that. It's because Jesus is supreme in both of our lives. That's the thing that makes the difference. Well, we wanted uh, to have a Bible study in our house. So we had a Bible study. We started a little Bible study in our house. Uh, the first night, we had six people there. Now, can very much come out of six people. Well, our little Bible study grew, and it grew, and it grew, and it grew, until one day in our house, we had 123 people. Now, I don't know about your house, but that's too many for mine. And I mean, we had them hanging from the chandeliers. We even had to have them sitting in the bathroom on the side of the bathtub, and we had the whole house wired up because we just didn't have room to put all the people that were coming in. But, you know, I don't think the Bible says it, but it's a good worldly thing. You build a better, better mousetrap, and the world will be the path to your door. And people at that time, the baptism of the Holy Spirit was not as widespread as it was today. And people began to hear that you could get the baptism if you came over to the Hunter's house. Well, the night we had 123, we decided that that was too much, so we decided to move to a hotel. So we went over to a hotel and rented a small ballroom, and we outgrew that in three months. So they opened the wall up, and, and then we had another, uh, another area and where we could hold about six, 600 people. We outgrew that. Now remember, this is just a little home Bible study. That's all, just a little home Bible study. No professional music or anything. As a matter of fact, many of you know, may know Jerry Woodfill that NASA space engineer who is also a, a director, I think, or something in the uh, full gospel. And uh, Jerry used to come over, and with his guitar, he'd sit on the floor, and that was our professional music. And he'd sing so off-key, but he was so anointed. I mean, the Spirit of God would just fall all the time. And uh, so then we moved it to a high school when we outgrew the hotel. Now, I want you to remember this, because I want you to put this into practice in your own life. We're not going to be telling you the things that God has done through us without telling you that if it can happen to us, it can happen to you, and it should be happening to you. So then we went to a high school, and the first night we were in the high school, we were anticipating about a thousand people. Now, I think that's a lot for a home Bible study, don't you? <laughs> but you see, you never know what's going to come out of a home Bible study. So Charles and I panicked. Because all of a sudden we thought, how can the two of us minister to a thousand people? I mean, if you take one minute for each one, that's a thousand minutes. So that's more time than you've got at the end of a service. So we thought, how are we going to minister to all these people? So we decided that we would teach our board of directors how to heal the sick. Because we firmly believe that the supernatural can be taught. And it's the easiest thing in the world. So we got our board of directors together and we started to teach them how to heal the sick. And so I said, now, at a certain time during the service, we're all going to walk off the stage together because there's power in numbers. How many of you know that? There is power in numbers. One could put 1,000 to flight, two could put 10,000 to flight. We had seven, I guess, on our board of directors counting us. Okay. Seven couples, that's right, seven couples plus us. No, that was counting us, wasn't it? 
And so that meant that we stepped off the stage together at one time. Do you realize how much power there is when that many people are in perfect agreement with each other? So we stepped off and there were six steps down. I'll never forget those six steps as long as I live because when we got to the third step, God spoke. And God said, the day will come when you will stand in the Astrodome with 120 healing teams ministering healing to the body of Christ. How many of you know how many the Astrodome holds? 69,000. Why, we had, never, we had never drawn anything like that in our whole life. We had never even drawn 6,000. And here God's telling us that we'll be in the Astrodome with, uh, which holds 69,000 people. But the thing that excited us was he said, with 120 healing teams ministering healing to the body of Christ. We got so excited, but we did not go out and rent the Astrodome the next day. Now this is where a lot of people get themselves in trouble. How many of you know that? You know why? Oh, God spoke to me. I gotta go do it right now. There is a timing and we need to wait until we hear from God and then put into action in his perfect timing. Because if you do it before God, how many of you know what happens? All right, now, this is where many people also make a mistake too. They think, well, God's just sending me to the desert. I'm just, he's just putting me on the back burner. So I'm just sitting here doing nothing, waiting to hear from God. How many of you know that's a lie of the devil? God never puts you on the back burner. God never sends you out in the desert. You might send yourself, but God never sends you out there. God never puts you on the back burner. What God does, God tells you to do every day what you're supposed to do. So Charles and I continued in our own little way to do everything that God was telling us to do. We were out there, we were ministering salvation of people, we were ministering the baptism with the Holy Spirit, and we went, we'd speak here, and we'd speak there, and we'd speak here, and we'd speak there, but we weren't on the back burner doing nothing, waiting to hear from God. Charles, we'd still be waiting, wouldn't we? All right. So we continued leading people to Jesus. We continued ministering the baptism with the Holy Spirit. We continued uh, ministering healing wherever we go. You know, Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a way of life that you live 24 hours out of every day. Amen? It's the same. I mean, to me, I'm exactly the same up here as I am on a plane, on a bus, in a restaurant, wherever I go. I'm exactly the same. As a matter of fact, a very interesting thing happened the other night as we came in. We flew in night before last, and we had a late flight, which was made later by the very fact we were about an hour late leaving Houston. So when we got off the airport, we went out to rent a budget rent a car and there was another lady sitting there Charles was on the inside uh, filling out the little papers and this lady's husband was on the inside uh, filling out the papers too and so she was sitting there and she was saying oh 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 and she said she looked at me and she said you know Los Angeles is not the place the Los Angeles airport is not the place to, to stay all day long is it and I said, no, I personally wouldn't recommend it because I think it's one of the most confusing airports in the world. And it seems to me like it takes you more time to get in and get out of there than almost any other airport that I know of. And she said, I have got such a headache. Oh, she said, my head really hurts. So I stood there and I thought, really? <laughs> really? She said, oh, it's just killing me. Now, I don't normally go up to strangers, but I have felt this little nudge from the Holy Spirit. So I said, would you mind if I laid hands on you and prayed for your headache? And she looked at me most peculiarly, and she said, uh, no, because it's amazing when you go in the power of the Holy Spirit how people will not say no. And so I just laid my hands on her head, or actually I just laid my fingertips on her forehead, and I said, in Jesus' name, I rebuke that headache and I speak healing. And she went, <laughs> And I said, what happened to your headache? And she said, it's better. I mean, 
She just absolutely, I said, do you have any pain left at all? She said, no. And she was utterly and totally just confused what had happened because I laid hands on her. So by that time, her husband came up and they went to get in the car and she turned around and she got in the car and she said, thank you for taking care of my headache. You could just see this utter look of astonishment. Had, had her husband waited a little longer, I would have led her to Jesus. But you see, that's just a way of life. Somebody has a problem, so what do you do? Do you say, take an aspirin, or do you lay hands on them? Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, that was just so exciting, because to me, that is just a way of life. Charles and I minister healing in restaurants. Now, just like last night, we went into a restaurant, and uh, they asked us what we'd like to drink, and Charles happened to be sitting on the outside of the booth, and so the waitress asked him first, and he said, I'll have water because God invented it, and nobody has improved on it. And she said, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> just, just like that. She said, you know, most Christians don't announce themselves like that. She said, you have to guess about them. But she was so excited, that, and so we told her about where we were going to be last night, so she came to the meeting and got healed. Now. You see what would have happened if we had not done that? You see, it's just a way of life. We just talk about Jesus wherever we go. And, uh, and I think that's why we have such a wild, exciting time all the time. So we did not hear God. We did not hear from God on this particular subject. Now, we heard from God on a lot of other subjects. But we never heard from God on this particular subject until about two years ago. God spoke, and he said, the first healing explosion, and that's what God called it, explosion, was going to be held July the 4th, 1985, in Pittsburgh. Now, remember, it took 12 years to get from the point where God said that the day will come and you will stand in the Astrodome. 12 years it took to get from that point to the point where God told us that we would have our first one. And the reason I'm telling you this is that some people get discouraged. You feel, well, God told me I was going to be in the Astrodome and everybody wants a big ministry. How many of you know that? Everybody wants a big ministry. Everybody wants to speak to hundreds of thousands of people. Everybody wants to see. Everybody gets, get healed. But very few are willing to wait on God but then while you're waiting, not just sit there twiddling your thumbs, you be out doing all the things that God told you to do. So we sent out the notices across the United States and we thought, God, I wonder if there are gonna be 240 people because we felt that God wanted us to have 120 healing teams. So you multiply 120 times the smallest healing team would be two on each team. That would be 240. And we thought, God, will there be 240 people in the United States that will answer the message and that will come and will believe that they're supposed to go out and they're supposed to lay hands upon the sick? And we were really surprised. We got the thrill of our life because over a thousand people <laughs> responded. A thousand people believed that if Charles and Francis could do it, they could do it too. They also believed that if Jesus did it, they could do it too. How many of you believe that you can do everything that Jesus did? His word says so, doesn't it? He said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, will you do also, and even greater works will you do do because I go to be with my father. Jesus expected us to be doers of the word and not just hearers only. And so we had over a thousand that came to Pittsburgh. And I tell you, when you have your first heating explosion like that, it's really something. But it was an explosion. I mean, it ended up to make history in the Pittsburgh area, and the repercussions of that are still going out. Even today, I talked to Pittsburgh this week, and they were telling me some of the great things that happened as a result of that. There were a, a thousand people came to be trained and were trained on the healing teams. There were 11,000 people there. And this is the first time since the 70s started off in the Bible. Remember, Jesus no doubt trained 70 people, even before the day of Pentecost. And he sent them back, and they came back so excited. They were wild. They were fanatical. Jesus, at the call of your name, at the mention of your name, demons came out, and people were healed. They were excited about this great move of God. And Jesus was so excited that uh, he whirled about, danced with reckless abandon. He 
danced in the spirit, really is what it was, that he was in the spirit. And uh, Jesus was excited because finally he saw the people going out and doing what he wanted them to do as he lived in and through the people. And so the first time there was a healing explosion was 70 people. In Pittsburgh, we had 1,000 people on the healing team, 11,000 people came, and when the power of God fell through these ordinary believers, it wasn't one can put 1,000 to fight, flight, two can put 10, 10 thousand flight but a thousand how many can you put a flight all of them hallelujah amen and when that great healing explosion was over we had an offering bucket full of hearing aids people who had been healed by the power of god charles and i did not lay hands on a single person that that was done by the believers who were out there on the on the floor of that great arena and some of the things that exciting things that happened uh you know god doesn't reserve that ability to lay hands on the sick for the old. He doesn't reserve it for the young. God says that every believer, as a matter of fact, let me read you the scriptures in Mark because this is, I want this burned into your spirit. I want it so burned in there that you will never forget it and it will just uh, absolutely come to your mind all the time. The 16th chapter of Mark, starting with verse 15, Jesus was speaking to believers. He was not just speaking to the believers or the disciples who were sitting there. If Jesus had been speaking to the disciples, he would have said, you disciples. But he did not. He gave this message to believers, to believers down the line. All the way 2,000 years down the line, these same words apply to you today. And Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he do, who does not believe will be condemned. I always say I was probably the oldest go-go girl that started in the business at the age of 49 because <laughs> the, all I heard was that first word, go. And I mean to tell you, I took off, Jesus opened my mouth, and I have not shut it since then because I want to tell the whole world about Jesus. And then Jesus made this wonderful promise. He said, these signs will follow them that believe. It was a promise to every believer. It wasn't just a promise to the disciples in those days. It was a promise to you and to me today that every believer would see signs and wonders and miracles following them. I like signs and wonders and miracles. How many of you like signs and wonders and miracles? And I like them following me. I mean, I don't like them following somebody else. I like them following me. And that's the way all of, you, all of us should be because Jesus promised us that signs and wonders and miracles would follow every believer. Sign number one, he said, in my name, they'll cast out demons. In my name. Whose name? Jesus. Jesus. We need to, to remember the importance of the name Jesus. We need to remember the, the power that is extended to us in the name of Jesus. You know, when Charles Hunter gave me his name, wow, did that give me power to sign on his checking account. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see, sometimes we fail to realize the authority that we have in a name. And under the laws of Texas, half of what you have belongs to me, half belongs to my daughter. I'm not real sure what it is. But you see what we, do, what we realize, when you have the authority of a name, you have a lot of power. Look at a policeman. He wears a little badge, you know, that says uh, Costa Mesa uh, Police Department. That badge means a lot. How many of you know that? When he stops you, you have to stop, don't you? Why? Because he's so important? No, because of the authority that he has in the badge that he wears. You know, I don't see people when, when those little police lights, you know, flash from behind. I don't see them going on and saying, ah, I'm not going to stop for you. How many of you ever, ever, ever had that horrible experience of those lights flashing behind your car? What's the first thing you do? You're overcome with guilt. Amen. But how many of you pull off as fast as you can? Right. You see, because they have authority, when they flash those lights, you know that you better pull over to the side. And the same thing is true of Jesus. If we could only realize the authority that he has given us in his name, Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. 
And then he said, Behold, I give you that same power. I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And he says, Nothing shall by any means harm you. Jesus had the power given to him, and then he gave us his name to turn around and to use that same power to create the same things that he did when he was on this world, on this earth. So he said, you'll cast out demons, and that means every one of us. I don't care whether you're young or whether you're old, that means each and every one of us. And then Jesus said, they will speak with new tongues. And one of the things that I think is so important for all of us to remember is that the Great Commission is a giving commission. You see, Jesus is saying, you go out and you give salvation away. You preach the gospel. You give it away. You give it away. You tell everybody what happened to you. You give it away. You give it away. All right? The same thing is true when he said, those who believe shall speak with new tongues. The baptism with the Holy Spirit. You're always going to have people say, well, my church doesn't believe in it. And to that great statement, I always say, tough God does. My church didn't believe in it either. Hallelujah. We just got promoted right out of there just because we got the baptism with the Holy Ghost. But you see, Jesus said that every believer without exception would speak with new tongues. I believe that's the reason today that we see such a tremendous increase in the hunger of people for the baptism with the Holy Ghost. We just were over in Manila in January and what an exciting thing as I gave the call for the baptism with the Holy Spirit 10,000 Filipinos got out of the sta- their stadium seats in one service and ran for the baptism with the Holy Spirit. It was like a cattle stampede. I said to them, I'm tired of the way Americans come to an altar. Did you ever look at the way most people come for the baptism with the Holy Spirit? Dragging their feet, dragging their feet, walking so slow, like, oh, big deal, I'm going up and get the baptism. I tell you, I think that we're living in days of acceleration when God wants you to run for whatever you're going to get. So I said, I want you to get out of your seats. I want you to run up here to the front. And they took me seriously. And you know, they took off. It was like a cattle stampede. That's exactly what it was like as they came running over that football field. It was like a cloud of dust came up because they were running so fast to get up there to the front to receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. But God is doing a new thing today. And you could either sit back on the bank and say, well, I'm not so sure I want to be a part of it. Or you can jump in the middle of it and you can get in on what God is doing. So Jesus said they will speak with new tongues. That means you need to minister the baptism with the Holy Spirit to every person that you meet. Would you believe that mo- that some of the greatest illiteracy in the church today comes in two areas? People do not know how to heal the sick and people do not know how to minister the baptism with the Holy Spirit. Many times they just lay hands on the people and say, receive the Holy Ghost. And then the person goes away totally frustrated because they have not ended up in speaking in tongues. And then 20 years later, they're still waiting for something to happen when people know. How will people know how to be saved unless we teach them? Amen. And the same thing is true with the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So we all need to know how to minister the baptism to something, somebody else. And then Jesus said, they'll take up serpents and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means harm them. And you know, Jesus meant that. Now, he didn't mean for you to go out and pick up rattlesnakes. How many of you know that? He didn't mean that. He meant that, who's the biggest serpent of them all? Satan. All right. So do we have more power or does Satan have power? We have. How many of you don't always act like it all the time? How many of you, all the devil's been after me. All the devil's been after me. All the devil's been after me. Well, if the devil is after you, you're going in the wrong direction. You need to turn around and go after the devil because Jesus said, amen. You see, the only thing that you should ever see of the devil is his back as he is fleeing from you. The word of God says, resist the devil. Resist him and he will flee from you. And like, I mean, so many people come up and they say, I'm losing my hearing. I say, not me. I'm getting better hearing all the time. You see, people don't realize what we bring on ourselves by some of these negative, and they just sit there and they wait for their hearing to go bad. Not me. I'm, when, I, when I rapture, I'm going to have as good hearing as I have right now. I'm going to have as good eyes as I have right now. And I have miracle vision in both eyes. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And it says, they will lay 
hands on the sick and they will recover. Jesus said every believer, every single solitary one of you are going to lay hands on the sick and they are going to recover. For 2,000 years, this has lain dormant. Now, I will grant you that there are pastors and there are evangelists and there are full gospel businessmen who do lay hands on the sick. But for the most part, the body of Christ has not been fulfilling the Great Commission. We have not gone out and done what Jesus said, that those who believe will lay hands on the sick. But you see, here's the best part of it. He said, you will see them recover. You will see them recover. And I believe that you and I are living in the day and the time when we're going to see the supernatural of God like we have never seen it in our entire life. You are stepping in on a threshold of learning how to heal the sick. You're stepping in on a threshold that is 10,000 times higher than where Charles and I stepped in some 15 years ago when we got the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And I believe it's all because God's Word says, In the last days I'll pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men dream dreams. We're living in the days when God is pouring out of His Spirit. I just have to tell you one exciting thing that just happened uh, two weeks ago, I guess it was, Charles, right? Two weeks ago. Uh, I liked fresh manna. How many of you like fresh manna? I don't like that old stale stuff. You know, I mean, I could tell you some miracles that happened 15 years ago, and those were exciting miracles. I love them. But I love the ones that just happened last week. I love the ones that just happened last night. Like this girl was brought in in her nightgown. Agony, pain and agony. You never saw anything like it. They had to carry her up on the stage, and we sat her down. She had a slip disc. And she was just crying in pain. Charles sat her down, ministered healing. It took all of 15 seconds, would you say, Charles? All of 15 seconds. And that woman jumped out of that wheelchair in her nightgown, began to hug Charles and anybody else that was around there because she had been totally healed by the power of God in just 15 seconds. I mean, it was just incredible. I wish you'd been there, doctor, to have taken a look at her back because she was in such agony when she came up, but totally, totally and completely healed by the power of God. But that wasn't the one I was going to tell you. I was just going to tell you one that happened last week to show you that we're walking into an era. We are in that era right now where you are going to see greater things than many healing evangelists of, the old, of, the, uh, of another age have ever seen. We were in a little town called Picayune, Mississippi. <laughs> have you ever heard of that? I had never heard of Picayune, <laughs> Mississippi in all my life until we were there two weeks ago. And... Uh, a deaf mute came up to me and I laid hands on him I stuck my fingers in his ears and I said in Jesus name now this is casting out devils I said in Jesus name you foul deaf and dumb spirit I command you to come out of there in Jesus name so I tested his ears and when you go to test a deaf person's ears who is totally deaf you use the sounds like baby, papa, mama. So I said, papa, nothing. Mama, nothing. Baby, nothing. So I said, you know, that means a little bit. And he began to cry. Well, I went on to the next person down the line. And uh, pretty soon his deaf mute was back in line again. So I thought, well, I'll do something a little different this time. Last time I commanded the deaf and dumb spirit to come out and nothing happened. So I thought, I'll speak a creative miracle. So I stuck my fingers in his ears again and I commanded a creative miracle. I commanded new eardrums <laughs> to form in his ears. And then I tested him again. Nothing. A little bit. He wasn't catching anything. So I kept going down the line. Pretty soon, here he is back in the line the third time. I thought, what am I going to pray for this time? And his mother was there. She said, you don't understand. She said, he doesn't need a creative miracle. He's got eardrums. But I had German measles when he, I was carrying him. And as a result, 
hair did not grow on the inside of his ears. I never heard of that. Did you know that, Doc? I never heard. Nobody ever told me this guy had hair on the inside of your ears to hear. But I thought, well, let's try something. You know, I never saw that in the Bible. But how many of you know that Jesus said that if all the miracles that he had done were written, there wouldn't be enough pages to contain them. And so this is why Charles and I experiment. So Mama told me he had no hair in his ears. That's why he couldn't hear. I thought, well, here, glory to God. So I stuck my fingers in his ear a third time. And I said, in Jesus' name, I command hair to grow on the inside of your ears. I expect to see this bushy stuff. <laughs> Going out all over the place. It didn't. What happened was this. Charles was probably, what, 10 or 15 feet away from us. And this deaf mute, who up until that time had spoken like this. He had learned how to form words with his lips. And so he was saying, but you see, no sound whatsoever would come out. And all of a sudden, he said, I can hear everything Charles is saying. He's spitting all over the place. You see, they haven't learned how to speak yet. And so, I mean, the saliva, talking about Holy Ghost saliva, it was just all, he was just spitting on everybody that was close to him. His mother and his grandmother, you never saw so much crying in all your life as mama and as grandma did. But I have to be honest with you, that's the first deaf mute in all of our ministry that I have ever seen totally and completely healed. I mean totally and completely healed. His hearing is so perfect, if I stood over by that exit sign and whispered, he could hear everything that I said. Now give Jesus a big hand for that. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. You see, I, I believe that, that, there is, that there is an increase in what God wants to do. And as a result, I believe that there is an increase in the pouring out of His Spirit. And God is looking for available vessels, people who are willing to say, I'm willing to go out there. And even if it doesn't work the first time, I'm, I'm going to go on. I remember at the very beginning of our ministry, I said, you know, if I laid hands on 500 people and they all died, I'd go out and get 500 more patients. <laughs> Well, the reason I probably said that was because the first one I ever laid hands on did die. <laughs> I was so mad at him. <laughs> I was. I, I went to the, I went to the to his funeral and said, "How dare you?" Because <laughs> I had prayed and I believed that he was going to be healed. But you know, I didn't give up. The devil would have liked for me to have quit, but I didn't quit. I kept on. And I have to admit, Charles, I had a terrible average in the beginning. Of course, that was before the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We were trying to get him healed without that, and not very much happens. But uh, then we began to start a, we started a Bible college. We wanted to teach people. Uh, we called it a how-to school. And one of the things that we wanted to teach in there was how to heal the sick. And before we started it, God gave me a tremendous vision that is shared in the beginning of the book to heal the sick. But God showed me, showed me little gold and little silver rivulets going all over the world. But the funny thing is, they were not orderly and neat. There was a blob here and a blob there and a blob, big thing here, and little bitty thing here, big thing here, little bitty thing there. And I didn't understand it at all. And then all of a sudden, I saw people of all nationalities standing up on these little bands. And I thought, well, this is people that God's going to bring from foreign countries to go to our school in Houston. But later on, I discovered that wasn't what it was at all. God was saying, nope, you're going to make videos. And those videos are going to go out and go around the world. And you're going to see people of all nations coming in to be a part of the end time ministry. And with my heart and with my soul, I believe the end time ministry for the body of Christ today is the fulfillment of the Great Commission that we are to go out. We are to lay hands on the sick. We are to see them recover. Well, after I had that vision, we wrote the book To Heal the Sick. And then about that time, we, we were in Kansas, and some people said, did you ever hear the vision of Tommy Hicks, a Methodist minister who had a vision in 1961? 1961 he had a vision 
and the vision is the most exciting thing in the world because it brings up to date what we're telling you today. In this vision, he saw the body of Christ. He saw it dirty, full of sin. And how many of you believe the body of Christ needs to be cleaned up today? We need to begin to walk in the beauty of the holiness of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. But he saw the body of Christ. And one of the things he said, the greatest thing that the church of Jesus Christ has ever seen lies straight ahead. It's so hard for men, men and women to realize the thing that God is trying to give to his people in these end times. It is hard for people to realize what God is giving to the body of Christ in these end times. He said, I received a letter several weeks ago from one of our native evangelists in Africa in Nairobi. This man and his wife were on their way to Tanganyika. They could neither read nor could they write, but we had been supporting them for over two years. He said, as they entered the territory of Tanganyika, they came across a small village. The entire village was evacuating because of a plague that had hit the village. He came across natives that were weeping, and he asked them what was wrong. And they told him that their mother and father uh, had suddenly died uh, three days ago. They had to leave, and they were afraid to go in where their mother and father were. So they pointed to the hut where the mother and father were, and this little missionary couple who could neither read nor write, but God had burned something on the inside of their heart. This little missionary couple went into this hut, and they said, it said, he simply stretched forth his hand in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, spoke the man's name, spoke the woman's name, and said, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I command life to come back into your bodies. Now remember, they couldn't read and they couldn't write, but instantly... These two people sat up and began to praise God. Amen. You see, and then it says, to us this may seem strange and a phenomenon, but this is the beginning of the end time ministries. God is going to take the do-nothings, the nobodies, the unheard of, and he is going to, to take the no accounts. He's going, how many of you belong in that category? <laughs> all right. He's going to take all of them and he's going to give them an outpouring of the Spirit of God. As you go on to read that vision, it talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and, 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 uh, and rising up again. And all of a sudden, uh, blue flames, fire coming out of his hands. And as he laid hands on people, the fire went into them. They were healed. And then they turned around and fire began to come out of them. And then they laid hands on people. And as they laid hands on people, the fire of God began to come out. A silver light began to come out. And then they turned around and laid hands on somebody else. And that's the thing that to us is so exciting today. Now I want to show you one of the things that just happened recently. And as I say, I love to share things that just happened recently. We went to Manila for a healing explosion. We, about 35 or 36 people went with us, all of whom had been trained in how to heal the sick because there's a tremendous difference in whether or not you know how to heal the sick or whether you just blindly go out. God will honor your, your faithfulness, I believe, and will heal but the percentage is so much greater once you learn how to heal. And so these people had learned how to heal the sick. And it was absolutely incredible because they went in the department stores over there. And they were so wound up that they began to lay hands on the sick in department stores. And we have pictures of people in department stores all laying out on the floor under the power of God. Now, because some believers got the message of what they're supposed to be doing uh, today, we saw some tremendous miracles happen in, in the department stores over there. Well, we had our healing explosion, and it was fantastic. Some 2,500 people had been trained via the videotapes to heal the sick. They, lay, they were laying hands on the sick, and it was just tremendous, the miracles that we saw happen. And Charles and I didn't get to lay hands on anybody because the end time message is for the body of Christ to get out and to do it. Well, after we left and came back home, then there was another the, uh, part of our group split up into three different cities. One went here, one went here, one went here. They had 12 on each team as they went. So then they taught, and this would be the second generation down, the second generation down, all right? One of them, Filipinos, 
the third generation, not the first, not the second, the third generation had someone come up to them with their arm cut off. I've never seen an arm grow back on yet that had been all cut off. I've seen a lot of miracles, but I've never seen one like that. That arm grew out all the way, all the way. By a first generation, no. By a second generation, no. By the third generation. What do you think is going to happen to the fourth and the fifth and the sixth generations down the line? You know, God gave us a wonderful word at our healing explosion in Denver. He said, I've used Charles and Francis Hunter to do great and mighty things. But the people they train, raise your hand because you're some of those people. Raise your hands, every one of you. The people they train are going to see far greater things than Charles and Francis ever dreamed or imagined. That's the day that you and I are living in today. That's why we are here to teach you how to do exactly the same things we did. I want everybody to say, if Charles and Francis can do it, I can do it too. Say, if Jesus did it, I can do it too. As a matter of fact, I can even do greater things than Jesus did because his word says so. Now, I want you to give Jesus a great hand. That's a promise to each and every one of you. That's a promise to each and every one of you.